all by playing with a little fire in his lab. That's how nuclear engineering exists. It's time for some more action lab. Specifically, why is it brighter? The accidental discovery that changed physics. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Foles. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's see. This is Black Fire. It oh. seems like a cool novelty made with a sodium vapor lamp and burning table salt. But at the heart of this Black Fire lies one of the greatest discoveries in science. Oh, he's getting at resonant atomic absorption, which is what we use all the time in nuclear engineering, spectroscopy. We do that all the time when analyzing and fingerprinting radioisotopes. It's called the anomalous Zeeman effect. I'm anomalous Zeeman effect. So the black fire itself demonstrates resonant absorption, and the Zeeman effect will tell you why the absorption changes under magnetic field. Which, if you think of it in terms of nuclear fuel absorbing neutrons, the black fire is the fuel itself absorbing neutrons at a specific resonance. And then it can either remain stable, it can fission, it can undergo radioactive decay. But the black fire, I think of the fuel itself. And the Zeeman effect is altering the cross-section, that is to say, the probability of fission by changing the environment, such as slowing down the neutrons, like using a moderator. But that's the way I look at it. I want to show you how black fire stops being so black in magnetic fields. Okay, yes. And why this one fact led to the discovery and measurement of magnetic fields on the sun, and even, even the technology we use to look inside solid matter with MRI machines. Okay, yep. In 1896, Dutch scientist Peter Zeeman was experimenting in his lab. He had a device similar to this called a diffraction grating. It's a material that, like a prism, can split light and spread it out according to its wavelength. For example, if I look at white light, I can see a full spectrum. But so this is basically how spectroscopy works. I mean, the difference is the light in this case is a way lower energy, that being visible light compared to gamma radiation, which is significantly higher energy light. And instead of a diffraction grating, we use high purity germanium detector. It effectively does the same thing and converts this energy into a measurable spectrum. If I excite individual elements, the spectrum isn't spread out anymore. There are only specific wavelengths that show up as lines on the spectrum. For and this is what's so good about it is you can fingerprint things. So this is great for reactor coolant chemistry control and detecting if you have any fuel failures. There's a specific fuel failure monitoring that uses spectroscopy in a nuclear power plant to detect if you have indications of a fuel failure. And by fuel failure, I mean bits and pieces of the nuclear fuel itself gets sloughed off a fuel assembly somehow. I've never seen that sort of thing happen, but it is at least a detection system that we have, and we have emergency procedures that allow us to respond to it. Basically, depending on the severity of the fuel failure, it affects what ramp rate you shut the unit down. Because in the case of a nuclear power plant, you emergency shutting down due to a fuel failure by doing a reactor trip, that might not always be the recommended solution. Sometimes you just do a slower orderly shutdown where you ramp down the turbine. Because after all, if something's broke with the fuel and emergency shutdowning rapidly inserts all control rods in in less than two seconds, well, that's not always the best solution. There are situations where that is, but it depends on what the reading of the fuel failure monitor tells you. So this is a very important component to have. And like I said, I've never seen it for real, but it was something that we routinely ran drills on. But the nice thing is every element has a unique fingerprint because quantum energy levels are discrete. That's what makes it easy to read. For example, this is the spectrum of helium. Mm -hmm. And this is neon. He was specifically looking at light coming from sodium vapor. To do this, he soaked a piece of asbestos in salt water and placed it in a... Of course, back in the day, right? Yes, in this time period that he mentioned, asbestos was a lot more commonly used. But please don't replicate that today. Bunsen burner. It looked like this, a bright yellow flame. Yellow. Then Zeeman had an idea. 
He had read that Michael Faraday had tried to affect light directly using strong magnetic fields, but found that light itself wasn't affected. But Zeeman wondered what if magnetic fields affect the atoms emitting the light, not the light after it's emitted. So he placed mm. the flame itself in a strong magnetic field and then looked at it through the diffraction grating. And he noticed something strange. Whenever the flame was in the magnetic field, the image of the flame spread out slightly. This meant that the magnetic field was shifting the frequency of the light both higher and lower than its original frequency. But why would that that happened. They knew electrons orbited the nucleus and a moving charge creates a magnetic field. So an orbiting electron behaves like a tiny magnet. Yeah, they viewed it as an orbital, like a more regular structure back then before the whole probabilistic electron cloud model that we have today. Though the term orbital is still used today. Like sodium's bright yellow emission, it's between the 3s and the 3p orbital is what causes the cool glowy yellow thingy. And it's pretty clean, that's one of the reasons why sodium is used in atomic clocks. Now imagine placing that electron in an external magnetic field it will try to align with that field now. For example, I have two strong... So those little orbital shifts, we're talking on the order of microelectron volts, which is absurdly small. That's like detecting a millikelvin change in fuel temperature. I mean, it makes sense because you're visually seeing atomic... You're seeing quantum mechanics take place with your eyes with that light shift, which is fascinating. But yeah, the order of magnitude is gonna be quite small. Magnets here. If I place okay. a smaller magnet between them, it naturally wants to align with the magnetic field. If I try to yes. rotate it out of alignment, it takes energy to do so. The same idea applies to electrons in orbitals. Normally, sodium emits- This is a great explanation of this, by the way. When an electron jumps from a 3s orbital up yep. to a 3p orbital, and then falls back down emitting a photon. In the 3p orbital, the electron can have three different orientations. Normally, all of these orientations have the same energy because the atom is rotationally symmetric. But when you apply a magnetic field, two of these orientations are no longer mm. aligned with the field. So instead of one energy level, there are now three. This is called Zeeman splitting. When you apply a magnetic field, it changes the energy states electrons can jump into, and that changes the light they emit. But can we actually test this? So that's really interesting. Symmetry broken by an external field. Kind of like you can have a symmetry in fuel lattice if your burn-up calculations are slightly off. Nothing catastrophic because, again, they met really small order of magnitudes we're talking about. In a high magnetic field, it's only on the order of about 0.01 nanometers or less than I need to distinguish between these wavelengths. Yep, yeah. Uh, these are all, like I said, millikelvins, microelectron volts. To give you a sense of scale with electron volts, by the way, uh, chemical reactions are on the order of electron volts to tens of electron volts, even, say, combustion, like in an internal combustion engine in your car. And fission is on the order of mega electron volts, 200 million electron volts released per fission. But yes, this 0 0.01 nanometers, yeah, you're not seeing that part. <laughs> That's why you use resonant absorption. Same reason why you use reactivity worth measurements, that is to say the departure from criticality, so say when you withdraw control rods, each centimeter of control rod withdrawal is given its calculation in reactivity, which tells you how much you're going to change the reactor from criticality. So if you withdraw them, it's going to go a bit up, and then you're going to go slightly supercritical, for a small amount of time until natural negative feedback mechanisms such as the Doppler effect balance it out and you stabilize as a slightly higher power level. That's one of the reasons why reactivity worth or control rod withdrawals or insertions for that matter are given in terms of reactivity worth rather than a neutron wave function, which is less meaningful operationally. And I can't measure that even with a benchtop spectrometer. But there's another way to see this using black fire. Instead of using a flame, another way to produce sodium light is with a low pressure sodium vapor lamp. This lamp heats sodium metal into a vapor and oh, runs a go. high voltage through it, producing almost perfectly monochromatic light, essentially one wavelength at about 589 nanometers. Now, if I shine that light through my. That's precise. 
sodium flame, something very cool happens. The light from the lamp has exactly the right energy to excite the sodium atoms in the flame. That means the flame absorbs the light. Since this is the only light source and in then the it room, appears the flame black. appears black. But that is cool. Because, yeah, like you said, that perfect, was it 589 nanometers, exactly matches that sodium orbital transition energy. Then the flame absorbs it. So the radiation detector that is your eyeball, well, the radiation, the photons, the visible light photons, do not reach your eye. So it looks black. Similar sort of resonance absorption you see when control rods absorb neutrons and the Doppler effect, the Doppler broadening that you see in fuel when you raise temperature. So the flame doesn't become dark per se, it becomes selectively opaque to the radiation detector that is your eyeball, which is really cool. If I apply a magnetic field to the flame, That's new energy states appear that don't match the wavelength of the lamp now. That means the flame absorbs less light Color and becomes comes back. brighter. So let's see if we can act. That is cool. Basically, you're shifting the absorption cross section by raising temperature. And it doesn't take much because it's a very narrow blind spot. Anything with quantum mechanics is really precise. Actually measure this. In order to do this, I need a very strong magnetic field. I have two strong neodymium magnets taped to these boards. So opposite poles are facing each other here. And it's a really strong field inside here. If I take another <laughs> magnet and try to flip it over, I literally can't flip it. <laughs> can't turn it. So let's see what- So those sound like a lot and they are, I mean, for your typical handheld bar magnets for playing around with, but it's gonna be tiny compared to say an MRI. But yeah. Clearly he's gonna see an observed quantum effect. happens when we lower this down over the flame. Okay, let's lower the magnets. At first, it doesn't look like much is happening, but if we look more closely and measure the brightness at a single point in the flame, we see exactly what we expect. Oh, here we go. When I lower the magnets, the flame gets brighter. When I like that he added the aluminum. It's always important to control your variables and eliminate any confounders that could possibly mess with your results. Good application of the scientific method here. When I lift the magnets back up, the brightness decreases. This is wild that I can actually measure this. I even put aluminum blockers around the flame yeah. to make sure the brightness change wasn't caused by wind or reflections from the magnets. And even- Oh, that's true. Just, just the wind could affect it as well. Yeah, that's cool. And then the flame is clearly brighter in the magnetic field. This confirms the Zeeman effect. Magnetic fields directly affect the wavelength of light emitted by the atoms. The consequences of this- And that's a very subtle little shift you're seeing right there. I like it. One factor enormous. For example, if we want to know whether sunspots have strong magnetic fields, we can compare the spectrum of light coming from sunspots to the rest of the sun. When we do that, we see Zeeman splitting. So the light coming off of these sources tells us about the local magnetic field. So that's really interesting because after all, a sunspot is just a convection zone suppressed by magnets. And this same principle is used in plasma diagnostics in fusion reactor experiments. I mean, that makes sense because after all, the sun is just a fusion reactor. The Zeeman effect doesn't just apply to electrons as well. Protons and neutrons have magnetic moments too. Yep. So applying a magnetic field changes the energy states they can occupy. And that's exactly how an MRI machine works. MRI scanners apply extremely strong magnetic fields and split the energy levels of protons in your body. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's gonna be proton dominant in the case of MRIs, specifically from all the hydrogen. But sure, I, I get what he's getting at. Magnetic fields splitting out energy states. And, trans and transitions reveal a structure. And then by probing transitions between these Zeeman split states, they can build detailed images of exactly what's happening inside you, all without using harmful radiation. Now, normal Zeeman splitting by itself is already pretty complicated, but we're not done yet. It turns out sodium doesn't behave exactly the way the simple Zeeman effect predicts. And yeah. Hate it when that happens. You got this model all set up and it just doesn't work out exactly the way it predicts, but that's life. In fact, the splitting was so unexpected that it was named the anomalous Zeeman effect. The reason for this is that sodium has an unpaired electron, and electrons yeah. themselves have intrinsic angular momentum, or spin as we call it. Zeeman didn't know this at the time. 
Yeah, it was still the classic orbital model, like a micro solar system, just dealing with electromagnetism rather than gravity. Yeah, that whole probabilistic model didn't exist back then. Time. This intrinsic spin gives electrons their own magnetic moment, meaning the atom effectively has an internal magnetic field yep. even when no external field is applied. Because of this, the p orbitals in sodium already have slightly different energies. I mean, we see this all the time in physics. There were so many, there's always a bunch of calculations that are done before any nuclear design. And then you see something you didn't quite expect, so it's treated as anomalous. I mean, to an extent, you see this today when you do low power physics testing. So calculating how the control rods would respond or how the reactor would respond to the insertion and removal of control rods is already done, double-checked, peer-reviewed by an outside vendor. But you still do testing at a very low power level in order to validate everything so you don't see any anomalous effects and the core you indeed refueled behaves exactly the way you say it does. Just another form of validation. So it's like the atom is applying its own external magnetic field to this electron orbital. That's why if you use a very good diffraction grating, you don't just see mm. one sodium line at 589 nanometers, you actually see two at about 589 and 589.6 nanometers. Yeah, that's real precise. The fine structure, which spin will be relevant at, and that's what atomic clocks actually use. And then when you really do apply a magnetic field, these two energy levels split into even more states. So this is called the anomalous Zeeman effect. This anomalous Zeeman effect Love is actually anomalous. quite normal because most atoms have unpaired electrons, but it took quantum mechanics to fully explain why it happens. So Zeeman uncovered a truth that helped lead to one of the greatest discoveries in modern physics, all by playing with a little fire in his lab. So to all of Hey, I mean, that's how nuclear engineering exists. Sometimes you start by playing with things, you note it as anomalous, and then you work your way back to theory and come up with models. You budding scientists out there, remember, sometimes playing with fire in the right context is okay. Safety first. And thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab. I this was really good, and it does show that tiny energy shifts matter. I mean, that's literally why nuclear power is so stable, because of those built-in natural feedback mechanisms, like the Doppler effect, Doppler broadening, by causing these little tiny resonance shifts. And you can do quantum state control at home. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.